The following is brought to you by Vertical Vet. Rethink your GPO. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another fantastic edition of Vertical Vets Business Academy. I am Chief Veterinary Officer, Dr. Ernie Ward, and it is my pleasure and honor and privilege to have some time with you today. And today we're going to talk about a topic that we've talked about a lot, I've talked about a lot, our guest has talked about a lot, but yet it is one of those perennial topics that we need to keep talking about, and that is better utilization of our support staff. Now today, we have an expert in this field. We have a registered veterinary technician who's done quite a bit uh, in her career, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. But really, I think both uh, our guest and myself, we've been singing from the same hymn book for the last 30 years, at least me for 30 years. And that is, how can we take a staff member of any capability, any experience level, any credential, and actually get them in a, a workplace where they're productive Productive, they're happy, they're getting along. How can we do this in an inclusive fashion? I mean, there's a lot of sort of buzz around this these days, but we've got to sort of do a better job of taking care of our staff. And so I am so pleased to introduce you to our guest today. She's been with us before at Vertical Vet, and that is Kelly Cronin, a veterinary technician who is just well known all around the world. Uh, she graduated from the University of Wisconsin Madison with a BS in animal science. She then went to, on to become a licensed veterinary technician in places like Alaska, New Mexico, Wisconsin. Uh, she then got her MBA from Mississippi State University back in 2012, and then she became a veterinary technician specialist in emergency and critical care in 2013. Many of you are familiar with her book, In the Middle, which is a book about veterinary management for veterinary technicians, because we've all been there many times. She's a national and international speaker presenting on leadership, management, and emergency and critical care medicine thank you so much for joining us kelly it's great to see you thank you so much for having me i've always had so much fun on the show <laughs> yeah well listen you know obviously we're, we're all just trying to make it better for veterinary medicine and i'll tell you you know the title of this is a little misleading it's utilizing our veterinary technicians in 2022 but kelly this could be 2032 and heck i know it was in 1992 when i was starting out uh so let's just just to set up today's discussion you know uh, and again you know what's the high level impact that you hope to have for people watching and attending I think the biggest thing that we need to do is make sure that at a high level, we're utilizing our team members to the top of their license. Because honestly, in order to deal with the huge influx of new patients that are coming into us, you know, courtesy of COVID, we have to be able to utilize our team members appropriately so that we can limit the burnout for everyone. And that's one of the biggest issues that we really run to is just making sure that we're constantly working at the level that we can so that we stay in the field and so that we stay engaged and so that we don't lose people to being overutilized. And Kelly, that's where I want to start today's discussion, and that is utilizing our support staff to the, as you say, top of their license, but to their maximum responsibility. And so, you know, when we look at the people that surround us in our clinics, I mean, they are widely, you know, experienced in their in, in their capabilities and, and credentials and so forth. But just, again, at a top level, what do you mean when you say, let's make sure we utilize them to the top of their license? And I also want to be sure to include non-licensed support staff. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the things that we see fairly often out in veterinary medicine is because of either a lack of training programs or because of just a lack of um, faith in our team members, we're not allowing them to do the things that they have even gone to school in order to be able to do. And one of the things that I'll say is that how can you effectively be a doctor um, if you are so concerned with doing some of the littler tasks that, um, you know, that our veterinary assistants can help with? I've seen doctors seeing dogs outside. I've seen, you know, I've seen doctors holding for IV catheters or technicians holding for IV catheters. And when we think about it, those are the people who in their license have the availability to do those tasks. And so if we can utilize our team members appropriately, and if we can train them to do as much as they possibly can, you know, every person who can do one additional task um, gives you that extra 10 minutes in a day. So yes, it takes you a little bit longer to train a team member to, you know, help you with disconnecting a dog or something along those lines. But training them to do that will allow that veterinary technician to go ahead and place two additional catheters in that day. And by golly, that might even allow them to take a lunch, um, which is 
amazing. <laughs> right. And, and again, this has been, you know, something, of course, uh, you're familiar with, you know, I've, I've written books and given who knows how many lectures on this topic. And, and really, it, it becomes more apparent today, as you mentioned, during COVID and the pandemic, during all the challenges that we've had. And really, a lot of our problems that we're seeing, Kelly, in my opinion, and in my observations all around the country, has been one of inefficiencies within the mm -hmm. clinic, right? I mean, so mm -hmm. we're not leveraging, we're not utilizing the support staff around us, and therefore, we're running behind or unable to see the patients that we need to see. So let's let's kind of, again, extend the conversation slightly. I, I think there's two things that I want veterinarians to take home and managers. Number one, know your state practice act. I mean, Kelly, I am still <laughs> baffled by the number of vets saying, you know, they can't do that. My veterinary technicians can't do that. And it's like, uh, yes, they can. In fact, just check out your state medical board and you'll find that. But then let's mm -hmm. also talk a little bit about how we can perhaps more efficiently utilize the support staff who aren't credentialed or licensed. Absolutely. I think that one of the things that we keep looking at is, you know, as veterinary technicians who are licensed, we really are thinking about, hey, how do we make sure that we can elevate what that license means? And I think that honestly, if we're stuck in the quagmire of doing some skills that are perfectly acceptable for our veterinary assistants with training, that really doesn't allow us to do the higher level skills that um, you know that we should be doing as professionals that are trained in that area. And so if we've gone to school and if we've done the work in order to become a licensed veterinary technician, really we need to be thinking about how can we better use our veterinary assistants and our support staff as opposed to holding them back. And I think far too often we're so concerned with, hey, we wanna really protect our license and make sure that we're the ones that are being most utilized in the clinic. We don't recognize that the most impactful person in the clinic is the one who's showing that next person how to do things and making themselves significantly more impactful on the number of cases that you can see in a day. And let's face it, like one in 10 podcasts fail, right? And so back in 2012, I remember watching you do a video uh, of uh, yourself in a hot parked car. And had you, had you not persisted and had you not kept working at your craft, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be watching all of these thousands of, um, you know, of, of images of you talking to the industry. And uh, now at this point, you know, there's, there's so much growth there. If we really invest that time and that effort into our team members, they're going to have that growth as well. They're going to become very, very good. And we can create a pipeline by encouraging them to go to school and continue to, you know, grow our profession. Yeah, and I'm really glad you mentioned that because I, I do find often that we sort of just don't ever even seek to give additional responsibilities, even to our licensed veterinary technicians. And and I agree with you, you know, certainly in, in our podcast, The Veterinary Viewfinder, <laughs> for the past five years, we have really tried to, to run, ram this down everybody's throats and minds. And that is the fact that this isn't about protectionism, right? And I do think there's still a bit of a chasm between like veterinarians trying to fight, you know, for their territory and veterinary technicians trying to fight for their territory. I mean, really, we need to understand that we, we both grow by expanding our responsibilities. I mean, whether it's telehealth, whether it's, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. look, I'm, it's no surprise. I'm a big supporter of like this nurse practitioner role that I think we need to evolve into at some point. I mean, again, I'm not saying that today, but Kelly, I think we need to head in that direction. Well, let's, let's kind of move to another bit of this topic, and that is around training. And, and look, you know, my bread and butter, when I started my first clinic in 1993, I mean, we realized that we were going to have to train people, put in real responsible guardrails, uh, or we mm -hmm. were never going to be able to leverage. I'm in rural North Carolina. You know, it was hard for me to find an associate back then. Sounds similar to today. And so I said, <laughs> I've got to maximize, optimize, utilize the people around me. So talk to us a little bit about some of the training programs and how you feel that they fit into any position in any veterinary clinic. I think one of the things that we don't do well is we don't look at training programs or we say that we don't have enough time. And that's, you know, that's one of two big complaints that I always hear when I'm talking to someone about putting a training program into place is we either don't have enough time or we have um, we don't have enough cases or we have too many cases to train. We're too busy to train. And the reality is, is that if you are too busy to train, you know, that's when you need to train the most, because honestly, if you can take and leverage those additional team members and make sure that you have someone who's coming in and helping, that is so much bigger and so much more impactful than staying quagmired in where you are. 
You know, it, and it's not a matter of, hey, can we hire an additional person? It's, hey, can we best utilize all the team members that we have? Can we allow those team members to replicate themselves? I think that we just really have to look at how our training program is being put into place, how we're utilizing it. And now one of the things that I hear often is our training program is fundamentally broken. And I hate to say it, but you know, there's a million different ways of reinventing the wheel. And it's more about how much you put into your training program than how well your training program is really set up or focused. Um, and I think that honestly, if we reinvigorate that training program, if we maybe make the tweaks, if we figure out how to involve the team members, and if we make sure that it's replicable for each of our team members going down the line, we can really do a big impact there. Yeah, and I really like the word there, reinvigorate. And and I, I totally agree. I mean, when we were doing our, when we started doing weekly staff training, you know, in 1996, and this is where, I mean, you, you know, I know famously or infamously, infam you know, we would close down, not see patients for two hours yeah. every Wednesday morning. But what, what, what I think made it work, Kelly, in our situation in particular, was the leadership's passion, enthusiasm, and, and really confidence that we were making a difference, right? And so, <laughs> like, if you just, and I remember, you know, we would sell our, our training materials, and these were like 500 pages of, of the stuff we had built. And I remember we, we stopped selling it after a couple of years because, Kelly, people just bought the book, and they were like, well, here's the book. Go train yourself. And it's like, that, that's, not what, that's not the secret sauce, right? So that yep. reinvigoration, that passion... Like your training will succeed based on your leadership support of it, I think, right? I mean, you've got to lead by example in, in many of these these areas. I believe that. I do too. And honestly, I have, um, you know, I have a training program boot camp that I actually offer through vettechlife.com. And I'll say what it is, is it's really working with the working with a clinic in order to set up a training program that's gonna best work for your clinic. Because honestly, it's all about making sure that the entire team is really suited for it, um, making sure that it's a training program that's gonna work with what your practice act allows, making sure that it's a training program that's gonna work with what your, your practice actually feels good about allowing, making sure that your team is invested and making sure that it's set up in a way that is sustainable for your team. Um, and I think that honestly, you can, you can buy a cookie cutter training program and it's fantastic. However, it's all about how you actually implement it. So that training program boot camp that I put together is more about the implementation, the carrots and the sticks that are associated with it, making sure that it's something that becomes culture for your clinic, as opposed to, hey, here's a cookie cutter training program that you plug and play. Right. And that's that word culture. And look, it has been mm -hmm. completely co-opted, turned into noise. Like I honestly I get frustrated every time somebody now throws out culture, but that's really what we're talking about. So, I mean, Vertical Vet members, when we talk about like your clinic culture, it's actually all of those values that, that, that you really believe deeply in and you enforce, right? And that's Absolutely. a little bit of the carrots and the sticks. I mean, depending on your, you know, where you are with mm -hmm. the particular topic, but, but Kelly, I mean, this is, it's fundamental to success. And I'll tell you, we, we, really, it's not too late. <laughs> you know, I really, you know, we're talking independent clinics out here. And I'm, let me tell you who took the advice I was given in the 90s. Those are the corporate owners of today. So they <laughs> got, they caught this, Kelly. I mean, they figured out, oh, these are systems. These are things we can reproduce. But independent clinics, it's not too late because you can have tremendous success, but you're going to have to to lean on people like Vertical Vet and Kelly and, and others, you know, who are really giving you the tools and resources to, to I think, you know, succeed seed in this hyper competitive. Now, I do want to touch very quickly, Kelly, on, you know, something that I think, again, my bread and butter was training everybody. And, you know, and, and back in the day, they were like, well, why do you have your receptionist sitting in and learning about Cushing's disease? It's like, well, they're going to get questions, you know, and they may have yeah. that follow up when they're invoicing somebody out. So talk to us a little bit about what you mean when you say, look, you've got to, you got to treat everybody, whether it's a kennel, you know, person to a veterinary technician. And I would include all of your associates, your management to not overlook the leaders. They need to be part of the training as well but explain to 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 our audience why you think it's important for everybody to be trained well dr word let me ask you a question have you actually uh, as a veterinarian have you been trained you know when you first got out of vet school had you been trained on how to talk to a client about an end-of-life decision well and that's unfair because i started the 
Success Club at Georgia, which later became the VBMA. So, so we were, in fact, my sophomore year, Kelly, that exact question, you know, not, not the end of life necessarily, but how do we talk to clients wasn't being raised. And my mentor, Dr. Bob Lewis, you know, I said, hey, he's like, well, why don't you get some students together and I'll buy pizza. And that's what started, you know, the Vet Success Club, which again, later morphed over several years into what's now the VBMA. But y yes, Kelly, no, nobody so still- you absolutely did. Yeah. But but no, but nobody's still being taught that. And that's really a deficiency within the system, right? I mean, and, and we could go a laundry list of skills that need to be taught in vet and vet tech school that aren't. But, you know, again, hey, this is what we got. So now let's fix them. Well, and I think that goes for our veterinary receptionists as well. You know, we set them up front. We kind of isolate them from the rest of the team. And then we ask them to be the first and last points of contact for our clients where they can make and break what that client experience is. And then, you know, they have they have all of the end of appointment questions that are so difficult to answer, and they have to go through all of that. And so when we are thinking about our training, you know, it's very easy to say, gosh, you know, they're just reception or they're just an assistant. They don't need that. But if we make our culture Again, that background noise, right? We make our culture actually a culture of learning. And if we make our, our clinics a why, not a how clinic. So instead of just teaching them, this is how you change a catheter, but this is why we change a catheter. This is why sterile procedure is important. This is why, um, you know, this is why we do X, Y, Z in order to make sure that our patients are well cared for. We're going to avoid so many mistakes. We're going to avoid costly issues with clients. We're going to avoid those angry clients. And we're going to give and empower our teams to actually deal with some of these situations that are so exacerbated by how mad everyone is during COVID. And I honestly think that we have such an opportunity there to really leverage these amazing people, because let's face it, they could make the same going down to McDonald's, but they chose to come into veterinary medicine, you know, and they're choosing to stay there. So the more that we train them, the better off we're going to be in terms of longevity. Right. And that's the secret. I mean, the reason that we yeah. had the average employee of seven years, you know, by the time I finished my tenure in practice at our main clinic was because of that. And, and so it, it, it transcends just knowing how, as you mentioned, to do something, understanding the why. But see, that connection is what really sticks people to you. And, and I mean, that is a strong magnetic force moving forward. So, you know, I, I, I feel strongly about it. But one of the other things too that you mentioned that you wanted to talk to us about a little bit today was that nobody has the time to train. And Kelly, this honestly, in the past 30 years, this is the number one obstacle that people throw back at me. Well, I, I could never close down my clinic like that. You know, I could never do whatever. You know, I don't have time or my people or whatever, right? I mean, an infinite number of, 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 of excuses, but time does seem to be the recurrent theme. So maybe give some practical advice for that clinic out there who's saying, I don't have time, and we're saying you do, and then you're going to tell them how. So one thing that I refer back to an awful lot when I hear I don't have time to train is the power of 10. So it's going to take you 10 minutes to train a team member on how to do a new task. Um, and by the way, I'm not talking about just training a member on how to do that new task, but I'm talking about also training them as to why they're doing that task and why that task is important and the different things that we have to keep in mind with that task. And um, when we're thinking about that, it's going to take that extra 10 minutes, right? And maybe as a trained technician, that would only take you two minutes normally, but that extra 10 minutes is going to be multiplied because they're going to be able to do that task 10 times that day. Now, 10 times 10 is 100 minutes that that technician who just trained that assistant gets back in their day. Now, multiply that over a week, over a year, and it becomes astronomical. And one of the things that I think we run into is we run into huge amounts of burnout with our upper level team members and they leave the field. Now, why is that? Because at the end of the day, when that emergency surgery walks in, who's the only one who can do that anesthesia, right? It's always the upper level team member. Well, who's going to get burned out the quickest if they have to stay for every single time that something like that happens? If we can rotate around, A, we're utilizing all of our team members, B, those team members are getting experience and they can become upper echelon technicians, and and C, we can make sure that we keep our long-term team members in the field a little bit longer by making it a manageable work-life balance. There is no one on this earth who should be so exclusive that they can't take a vacation. And let's face it, like everyone needs one this year. 
Right. And I do want to get, revisit this about the practice diva and devos in just a second. But, you know, the time <laughs> issue becomes, again, a bigger barrier. So, uh, A, I love the 10 minute rule that you've got going on there because it, it is exponential. The other thing, too, <laughs> I'll tell you, if, if you don't have 10 minutes, you have a minute. That's why I used to call it one minute training, because simply if I turn to a technician or receptionist and explain the why of whatever it was that we were dealing with, then that, you know, you can often do that in a very succinct fashion. So don't don't overlook the very quick hit that might have profound mm -hmm. impact moving forward. But again, you know, Kelly, I, I do I, I do think it's important to have structured formal periods where you actually say, we're gonna devote this time. I mean, it's no different like in my practice life and and look, discipline is another one of those words that's kind of gotten hijacked over the years. But, mm -hmm. you know, there is an aspect, an element of discipline that also bakes in the culture, right? I mean, because if I get up every day and I do certain levels of exercise and activity, it just becomes who I am. And, you know, now I'm getting older. But, you know, no matter what, you know, there are certain things that I do to nurture and fortify my health. Explain mm -hmm. why you think that, again, this time is so essential to carve out no matter what, because that's probably the most valuable time you'll ever spend. So I think one of the things that we really have to be cognizant of is that when we're talking about training and when we're really working with our team members, we have two different types of training that can go on. There can be focused training where you're spending, you know, an hour or a half hour or 15 minutes on a focused training. And that's really instituting that, that culture of learning, instituting that importance of learning and making sure that our team members really have that time to focus on the learning that we're handing them. But there's also an idea of setting up your training programs so that you can do the training in between other things, so that we don't stop the ability to put that team member on the floor and have them be a productive team member. And and so that we make sure that we're making them a very safe team member in terms of not doing things that they're not trained on. And so one of the things that I really um, kind of hedge my bets with in any of the training programs that I put into place is making sure that I have a mastery system associated with any of the skills on the skills list that I work through, because I want to make sure that those team members have something to refer back to so that if the training gets interrupted or if that skill set is something that doesn't come up as often, that they can come back to those things and that we can keep moving forward and progressing in their training without it being a situation where we have to stop everything and put them with one person. And then the other thing I like to think about is the fact that everyone in the team should be involved in training because you're going to glean a little bit different information from every person that you encounter on the team. And beyond that little piece of different information that you might glean from that team member, there's also a thought process that every team member can help. And then that person who is responsible for that training program is not getting burnt out as well. And you're not bottlenecking the training by making it only one person that can work with your team members. So the more that we can leverage everyone who helps on the team and everyone who can train on the team, that really busts up that whole myth that there's not enough time to train because everyone can take that extra 10 minutes in a day to show a team member how to do another task. And you can continue keeping progressing forward by having a checklist where you can refer back to what you need to do in order to bet better help that team member rise to that next level. Yeah. And again, Kelly, you know, I, I can just from my own personal experience, just whenever I or our, our key leadership figures would participate, I mean, which we always did, that was just part of what we did. That right. also, that leading by example makes such a, a huge difference, in my opinion. Even when I would go visit our other clinics, you know, and just show up on training days and just, yeah. you know, participate and role play and ask questions and answer questions, hopefully, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, there's such enthusiasm when they see that the leadership takes it seriously too. But I do want to keep Absolutely. coming back as we kind of finish up today's conversation. And that is what, you know, what we were talking about, these super techs, the practice diva and devos. And, and these are the people that maybe have somehow concentrated an inordinate amount of power or responsibility that then leads to, to divisiveness within the team. Uh, it means that you're, you're unable to perform when they're gone. I mean, there's a lot more to this. And, and, you know, look, over the years, I think I wrote my first article on this practice diva thing, probably around 2008, nine, somewhere in that time. And, and I remember, you know, Kelly, people, it was not received very well because, you know, people were like, oh, you know, you can't, you can't 
uh, touch that. You know, I mean, I want a super tech. I want the person. But I always felt like they were, you know, more destructive in the end. And I'd seen this, I'd witnessed this, my own practices, right? I mean, I'd had these people and when we finally let them go due to whatever reason, legitimate reason, um, you know, other people flowered around them. So maybe talk a little bit about what you mean by beware the super techs and maybe some tips for, for dealing with it if you think you might have one. Well, now think about this, though. I do think that there are super techs out there, but I think honestly, the super techs are the ones who take that moment to train the others. You know, I think that you are only as good as the next person that you've brought up the ladder. And so I think what you think about is you think about that technician who, you know, they've been in that clinic for 10, 15 years, and they're the only ones who know how to place a long line, or they're the only ones who know how to do anesthesia on XYZ type of case. And the reality is, is that they're doing more harm to the rest of your team because of the fact that they're running around like chickens with their head cut off. And I have seen some really, really good, um, you know, information about this. There's a video called Super Chickens that uh, really discusses, hey, how much it really harms your team to have someone who is absolutely the best and can't make room for others to grow. And I think that honestly, if you have a team that is so focused on learning and so focused on training others, you you kind of you stomp out that super tech mindset of, you know, I, I need to know how to be the best. I need to do everything the best. And you get to the point where you recognize that you don't have to know how to do everything, but you have to know who does and how to how to multiply that knowledge and how to make sure that your whole team keeps rising to a new standard. Um, and I think that honestly, you know, it's it's a huge joke. It really, really is. But the big joke that I've always had is I've always enjoyed training because I'm inherently lazy. Like I inherently love the idea of having someone to help me on X, Y, Z type of uh, type of task. And honestly, you know, when we look at ourselves and we look at what we delegate and what we can give to another person, we're only holding someone back if we don't delegate appropriately. Right. And, you know, I used to describe this as I was just trying to amplify myself. And I think that that honestly, and, and again, you know, I got in a lot of hot water, you know, early in my career, because I would say you have to let go your ego when you walk in the clinic. And, you know, vets, I mean, come on, there are a lot of us that are really wound <laughs> up in this. This is our whole identity, right? Which is a whole nother subset of problems that we've talked about at Vertical Vet before. But regardless, you know, Kelly, I think when you can say my value is in what I can give to others and how I can help others and amplify, you know, the entire team, I think that's that's the huge difference and I think what what has happened and I, I hope it changes I, I I don't know that it is because it's human nature but when we value our ability to help others over just what we can do you know the the, the hows that you mentioned earlier that's when you that's it's transformative and I'll, I'll tell you mm -hmm. It's the secret to not burning out. It's the secret to being 55 years old, 30 years in the practice, and still, you know, finding joy. I, I think, you know, but but getting back, so, so, and again, I want to be clear, Kelly, we're not talking about just veterinary technicians, which is sometimes people get hung up there. This can be an associate doctor. This can be a manager. This yeah. can be anybody, right? So we're using that term loosely, but, but again, you know, um, I, I, I want to hear from you. What do you do if you see this? If this is actually in your clinic, what are some of the first steps you can do to correct it? I think one of the things that I first do is I really have that sit down with that person and I explain what I value in a team member, especially if it's someone who's potentially a direct report or an employee of mine. Um, I like to have that conversation and say, you know, this is this is what I need from you. I really appreciate the fact that you have the ability to do these things, but if you're not training that next team member on how to do it, you're not useful. Uh, you know, you're, you're becoming that person who is the end user as opposed to the person who's helping everyone else get to that point. And so I think that that's the first and foremost thing. And then I try to incentivize them to really get out of that mindset of hoarding knowledge and hoarding skill and make sure that I'm incentivizing them to help drive that skill to other people. Now, what I'd say is I'm very wary of adding, um, you know, adding incentives to a team member who's not wanting to train because of the fact that I really worry that they're only doing it for the incentives as opposed to doing it in order to, you know, help that person grow or in order to grow themselves as a, as someone who's training or teaching. And so I, I'm really careful about not 
putting it as, um, you know, here's, here's an extra $15 to train because of the fact that I don't want that type of, uh, you know, relationship in my clinic. I want everyone to be involved in training. And beyond that, if I have folks who are on my team who are already willingly training, you know, I'm going to probably incentivize them more, you know, and really um, appreciate them for putting forth the effort without having to have any kind of, you know, monetary incentives associated with it. So I'm more likely to potentially, you know, give some type of um, either wage or leadership type of growth to someone who's already training and make sure that the team really understands and sees what that looks like uh, so that they're incentivized to train as well. Yeah, I love that advice, Vertical Vet members. That's that's actually spot on. And I think the first step is always to to talk to them about it. Maybe they just aren't aware yep. of their behavior or how they're being perceived by others around them. And so, you know, there's always that chance. I will say, you know, be prepared that it just doesn't work out. And you have to, at some point, circle the wagons around your team, your good team members who are just desperate to learn more and grow. Uh, and sometimes that means you have to, to take one wagon out. And so, you know, I think that's probably the hardest part because what I get... And I'll never forget, I was doing a, a consult. Oh, gosh, this is, you know, probably early 2000s. And it was a very, you know, large clinic, similar to mine, you know, had awards and so forth. And within the first day, I recognized they had a, a practice diva who was an associate veterinarian. And this veterinarian was really competitive and all that stuff. And so at the end of my three days uh, visit, you know, I said, well, listen, here's my findings. This is what I think you should do. And oh, my gosh, <laughs> Kelly, I was like, they're like well, that, that person's my most productive vet. They make the most money. People love them. I'm like, but your staff hates them. You know, they're terrible yeah. for morale. Everybody complained about this. So, you know, and, and sadly, they did not uh, fire this person. I did hear through the grapevine that a year later, this person actually left and went to another clinic. Again, more damage. <laughs> so, so if you do, if you are in these situations, I would say, take it seriously, right, Kelly? I mean, too often, if you ignore these problems, they don't just get better on their own, as some people would like to think. Well, I think we have to really look at the mindset of, you know, what's good for the many as opposed to good for the few and making sure that we really work with the few in order to get to them to that point of being able to recognize, you know, what that really looks like for their clinic and how they're actually damaging the, the clinic um, and, and how they're damaging people in general. I think fairly often when you look at the people who are very knowledge hoardy or who are, uh, you know, not about bringing up other team members, they're not happy in life. They're maybe not happy in their job. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but one of the things that has kept me in this field for so long is the fact that I'm constantly looking for the next big challenge. I'm constantly looking for the next thing that I want to add to, you know, to my repertoire. And honestly, I think that that's been a really good opportunity to bring others along with. And I think that the moment that we can keep having people grow is the moment that they're going to continue to stay in this field. Yeah. And, and Kelly, you have, I mean, obviously you've impressed people like me and many, many others and you've helped so many. So if people want to learn more about, you know, vet tech life, I mean, tell us a little bit about how we can find out, you know, how to get in touch with you. I mean, obviously vertical vet members, you can always go through us and we'll connect you. But you know, if you just want to go directly to the source, what do they need to do? Absolutely. www.vettechlife.com um, has all of the information there. There is a way to contact me right on there uh, through our Facebook page, www, or, uh, our Facebook page, Vet Tech Life, as well. Um, we have an Instagram page, although it's probably not gotten as much love as the Facebook page, which is uh, vettechlife. spelled out dot com. And uh, I would definitely love to connect there. Certainly shoot me a message if you have any questions. Um, I do have that training program boot camp up on there. I'm constantly adding new courses and new content. And so trying to keep it very re uh, relevant to everyone. And then, you know, if you ever see me out and about speaking at one of these conventions, come up to me. I really, really enjoy talking to everyone. And there's just there's so many good connections to be made there and uh, never be shy. Yeah, and Kelly is absolutely not shy at all. If you see her out and about, just go give her a big hug or in COVID times, an <laughs> uh, elbow bump or yeah, whatever yeah, we're supposed COVID to do. Times. I don't know anymore. I don't know. I'm a hugger and it's been horrible for me. But anyway, <laughs> Kelly, I can't thank you enough for spending time with Vertical Vet membership today. I mean, again, you know, we just, we love what you're doing. We appreciate all the support you've given to the industry and the profession for you know your career. And just thank you, thank you, thank you. No, and thank you as well. You know, I've been a, obviously a long time listener, so. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, Vertical Vet members, once again, thank you so much for your attention today to another wonderful business academy. I mean, Kelly Cronin is one of our partners. The reason that we partner with people like hers because we know that she can help elevate your team. And again, this is about so much more than just revenue and productivity. This is about happiness and harmony. And so at Vertical Vet, we are a team of many veterinary technicians and veterinarians and people that have done it for a long time. And we know the trials and tribulations of daily practice. And that's why we want to bring people like Kelly and others to you to help you have a better, more successful life. So again, on behalf of the entire amazing veterinary team, over at Vertical Vet. I am Dr. Ernie Ward. It has been my pleasure. We will talk to you soon. Bye, guys.